The US economy is often described as a driving force of the international economy, but since 2008, growth in the US has been very anemic. What have been the reasons for this? Traditionally, the US economy grows about 3% a year. Uh, and coming out of a recession, normally you have a couple of years of very strong growth to make up for the losses. Well, we haven't had that bounce, that strong growth. We haven't even gotten up to the 3% long run growth rate. Instead, uh, we consider ourselves lucky to have about 2% growth. Now the question is, why such an anemic recovery? There are some potentially technical explanations about financial recessions being more difficult to overcome, but I think a lot of the blame belongs to Washington. We've had some big tax increases. Uh, the Obamacare has just added to the already heavily government entangled health care system. Uh, so I think Washington really deserves a lot of the blame for subpar economic growth. We become more like Europe in America, so it's no surprise we're having European type growth numbers. You've got a presidential election, of course, in 2016. What are the prospects for growth in the four years after that election? Frankly, elections only make a difference if you actually get changes in policy that are significant. Now, there are several establishment candidates from both parties that will pretty much keep government the way it is, which, of course, leads me to think that there's no reason to expect any, any rapid growth. As a matter of fact, we, we might have uh, the collapse of a bubble because of all the QE and the government spending. On the other hand, there are some reform-minded candidates out there. So if you wind up with a sufficient number of free market supporters in the House, in the Senate, and a free market supporter in the White House, then we actually could have sort of a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, to engage in really systematic structural reforms that are necessary to get the U.S. economy uh, back on its historically strong 3% growth track. Of course, there have been reforms within individual states within the U.S. Have these reforms been sufficient to make a difference to the economy as a whole? The United States, because of its federal system in 50 different states, is a laboratory, and we learn a lot. We learn that zero-income tax states like Texas and Florida grow a lot faster than high-tax welfare states like New York and California. But that only gets so far because the central government in Washington is, is two-thirds, maybe even 70 percent of what actually happens in America. So it doesn't matter how good a state like, say, Tennessee or Texas or South Dakota is doing, if Washington is pursuing bad policy, uh, you know, the states are the tail, Washington's the dog. Just as with European countries, the U.S. has the very large forthcoming social security and health care liabilities. What are the prospects for the U.S. over the next 20 or 30 years, over a generation or so? The long-run fiscal numbers in the United States, if you leave government policy on autopilot, are downright frightening. Uh, in effect, our debt and deficit numbers because of the unfunded liabilities and the implications for an ever-rising burden of government spending puts us in worse shape than a lot of Southern European countries. Uh, so if we don't actually engage in the systematic structural reform of the right kind, not price controls, not means testing, but actual restructuring to give individuals more control and authority over their own money, then I'm afraid that, that anything that we've ever heard about in terms of American exceptionalism, uh, America being a free market beacon, all that stuff will be a thing of the past and will, will be washed away by this tsunami of entitlement spending uh, that will turn America into France. In practical terms, what could be done to restore the financial health of the U.S. economy? Well, the bad news is our long-run prognosis is becoming France or Greece. The good news is we actually know some of the reforms that would stop that from happening. And for four years in a row, the House of Representatives has voted for Medicaid and Medicare reform, and those are the health care entitlements for the poor and for the elderly. And those entitlement reforms that the House approved in one fell swoop would solve more than half of our long-run problem. And there are, of course, also proposals now to undo some of the damage of Obamacare, to deal with our Social Security government-run tax and transfer pension scheme. So we actually know what the policies are that would save America uh, from this long-run entitlement catastrophe. The question is whether or not there'll be the right coincidence of the right person in the White House with the people in the House and the Senate who are willing to make the tough decisions today 
to avoid fiscal collapse 20 or 30 years from now. In practical terms, do you think these sorts of reforms will leave poor Americans on the streets without health care and without pensions? Probably the simplest example to look to is we had welfare reform in the 1990s under Bill Clinton. Now at the time, you had all sorts of hysterical predictions. Oh, this is going to hurt poor people. You're going to have an increase in child poverty. Uh, this is cruel and heartless and draconian. Instead, the welfare reform that Bill Clinton signed, enacted by a Republican Congress that was bipartisan, turned out to be great news in terms of reducing child poverty, getting people back in the workforce, uh, ending some of this culture of dependency that is so poisonous for low-income communities. And I think the Medicare and Medicaid reforms that we're looking at in Washington uh, hold some promise to be equally successful, assuming not only that they're enacted, but that they're sustained over time, because that, of course, is a challenge. You do a good reform one year, and five years later, uh, some other group of politicians erode the reforms. So my hope is that what's happened in Southern Europe, and of course, I'm expecting additional bad news from France and Belgium and Japan over the next you know, 5, 10, 15 years. The bad news that we've seen from some countries I think is helping a lot of people understand that the modern welfare state, especially combined with demographic change, aging populations, lower birth rates, you can't maintain the traditional tax and transfer Bismarckian welfare state. You have to reform or we're all going to be Greece.